Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you've done. Talk about or what I want to try to, to share. So uh, tonight, though, I, I, had, I had come across a passage that, that uh, I find very interesting. And so devotional tonight should be pretty simple. We're going to just go ahead and do some reading through this chapter. And then we'll pull out just a few observations. It may seem kind of random at the beginning. Hopefully we'll be able to tie it all together towards the end. But as we, uh, as we think about what this chapter in, entails, um, you know, you could probably flip back just a few pages in your Bibles and you should be able to see some headings to kind of give away what we're leading up to. Things like preparations for building the temple, things like building the temple, the temple's furnishings. Um, and then here in chapter 5, it brings us to the, the Ark of the Covenant being uh, brought to the temple. So let's begin chapter 5, verse 1. It says, when all the work Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished, he brought in the things his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and all the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of God's temple. Then Solomon summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite families to bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant from Zion, the city of David. And all the men of Israel came together to the king at the time of the festival of the seventh month. And when all the elders of Israel had arrived, the Levites took up the ark. And they brought up the Ark of the Tent of the Meeting and all the sacred furnishings in it. And the priests, who were Levites, carried them up. And King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the Ark, sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. The priests then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark and covered the ark and its carrying poles. And these poles were so long that their ends extending from the ark could be seen from in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place. And they are still there today. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. The priests then withdrew from the holy place. All of the priests who were there had consecrated themselves, regardless of their divisions, all the Levites who were musicians, Asaph, Haman, Jeduthun, and their sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar, dressed in fine linen and playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets, and the, trumpet, the trumpeters and singers joined in unison as with one voice to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they had raised their voices in the praise to the Lord and saying, He is good. His love endures forever. And then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord of the temple of God. So as we move through this passage here, there are some things that seem a little bit, uh, I don't know, uh, unknown to us. You know, we don't sacrifice animals. We, we don't use instruments in our worship. Um, there's no great cloud that fills the building whenever we gather together here and to worship God. But those are all three things that I want us to kind of pull out of this and to look at just uh, in a little more detail. It says in verse 6, there was, this was something that really wowed me. They sacrificed so many animals that they lost count. Now, how many of you farmers could afford to just decide you're going to give away more cows than you can count. Well, number one, I guarantee you know exactly how many you have, don't you, if you have some. Or regardless of uh, the livestock that we're talking about, you know, this is, this is not a small feat. I know we're talking about a nation of people, but sheep and cattle in this time were important uh, for several reasons. They provided things like food, clothing, uh, something to drink if you weren't killing them, to eat, right? So these were all things that were important to daily living, so by killing them, they're not only getting rid of something that was of value to themselves right then, they were also giving away, uh, they were also getting or eliminating the possibility of future enjoyment uh, or needs being met. Now, today, of course, we don't sacrifice animals, but we do give away things that we can never, never give back, things that are valuable to us right now, things like our time and our money. Think of the ways that we eliminate future use of time and money in service to the Lord uh, whenever we give of these things right now. You may have already thought of some of those things, but the thing that really took my breath away about this passage was the fact that they sacrificed so much that it couldn't be counted or recorded. Can we say the same thing of our money? It's not likely. Can we say the same thing of our time? 
our own desires, our very hearts. May our modern day sacrifices for the Lord be as great as what theirs was. Verse 13 also mentions something very interesting. It says that the, that the trumpeters and singers joined in unison as with one voice. Now, despite the fact that I'd really like to run off on a tangent here and talk about, you know, the, the use of instruments in, in Old Testament worship, I'm going to abstain from, from that desire, and we'll save that for another lesson altogether. Instead, I want us to focus on just the phrasing that they, when they did these things, uh, they did it as with one voice. Um, they blended their instruments and their voices together to give thanks and praise to the Lord. Now, today, the instruments are our hearts, right? And we are to blend our hearts together with our voices whenever we sing and give thanks and praise to the Lord. So the question has to be asked, are we making a diligent effort, though, to join these things together, to join our hearts in worship and our voices together uh, as with one voice? May our modern-day sacrifices of the fruit of our lips for the Lord be as great as what theirs was. Verse 14 says that the glory of the Lord, uh, a cloud, if you will, filled the entire room during their worship. And now the ark was a symbol of God's presence among his people, and the cloud, the glory of the Lord, was seen regularly during that time. So um, perhaps we can think of it in a way that it was no great feat for God because he did it several times throughout the course of, of our recordings of the Old Testament, but still it was a pretty incredible thing to, to have been a part of and to witness. So since there's no cloud to force our awareness of his presence, are we any less aware of his dwelling among us whenever we gather together to worship? May we, when we engage together in worship, be ever thinking about how great his presence is with us and in us. So these things that we've mentioned here, the sacrificing of animals, the, the playing of instruments, the presence of a physical cloud, all of those things have changed and, and they don't longer take place today. But I like verse 13, which says, as they sang, he is good and his love endures forever. We should be grateful that this aspect has not changed. May our modern day worship be as great and meaningful as that is, as the Israelites of old. If you have a need tonight, we'd encourage you to come forward while we stand and sing a song of encouragement. Let